Welcome to the Attention Deficit Disorder Expert Podcast Series by Attitude Magazine. Good afternoon, everyone. It's Susan Coffin here from Attitude Magazine. I'm really pleased to um, welcome you to our latest webinar. Today's webinar is with Susan Kruger, who is a learning specialist, a study skills specialist, and certified reading teacher. Um, with some 20 years experience working with kids, um, children like our children with ADD and other special um, learning issues. She is herself an ADHD mother of two ADHD children, so not only does she have professional experience, but she also knows exactly what you're going through. So Susan, thank you for joining us today, and let me turn it over to you for um, a few words of introduction. Um, well, it's a pleasure for me to be here. I've enjoyed Attitude Magazine as a parent and a teacher for quite a long time, so I'm thrilled to be able to contribute and to work with your audience. Um, today, since we're talking about tools to help your child excel in school, I thought I would first share just a very brief uh, bit about the mechanics of what we're dealing with. So in order to identify the right tools, it's really helpful if we know what's going on in the brain. And that's what I'm going to share with you here for a couple minutes as we get started. Um, the first thing that's really important to know, and this is really critical for anyone who's dealing with a learning disability or dealing with ADHD, is to understand that the brain has many different sections. Each section is responsible for different types of information. The frontal cortex, which is where ADHD originates, is the organizing center of the brain. It orchestrates everything from your five senses and feelings to the thoughts you generate in response to them. Now, the front cortex in all sections of the brain communicate through a series of wires called neurons. Now, the brain is a collection of these neuron wires. There's actually billions of them inside of our brain. These neuron wires literally create pathways in our brain for every thought and movement that we make. And although we have billions of them in our head, any one of these neuron connections is really just like this basic circuit right here. So this string of lights represents the circuits in our brain. The first bulb is our frontal cortex. It receives information, it determines what to do with it, and then it sends directions to the rest of our brain. So this is, again, we've got billions of these circuits in our head, but every one of them is operating on the same basic uh, format. The question I have for you, though, is what would happen if this circuit is cut? Basically, if we cut this circuit, the power goes out. And these power outages happen regularly in an ADHD brain. ADHD is caused by a lack of chemicals that power brain connections. So typically we're most familiar with uh, norepinephrine, dopamine, and serotonin. These are particularly norepinephrine and dopamine are the two main chemicals that are addressed in um, drug therapy for dealing with ADHD. With the shortage of these chemicals, the front cortex sends weak signals to the rest of our brain. Sometimes those signals connect, but many times those signals never reach their destination and we find that the power goes out. So this is a very brief explanation of what's happening in our brain when, when we have ADHD. Um, but my question then is, what does this have to do with managing school and homework? And ultimately, the answer is that ADHD brains do best with fewer connections. And this ties in with school and homework and really anything in life, but we'll focus specifically on performance in school today because the, the more we can take a strategy and, and, and narrow it down to the fewest steps possible, the more success our children are going to have with managing their schoolwork. Um, I'll give an example. First of all, let's imagine that your child is in class and the teacher passes out homework and expects that your child is going to be able to put the homework away uh, correctly in their book bag, get it home, do the homework, and get it back to school. We all know that's one of, the, one of the greatest challenges for our kids. Well, this is what's happening. With the traditional method of having several, excuse me, several different folders and notebooks, the child has to follow a great sequence of actions that goes something like this. They have to grab the paper, set the paper down, reach down, open the book bag, move books out of the way, flip through the folders, find the right folder, grab the folder, pull it out, set it on the desk, open the folder, slide the paper in, close the folder, pick the folder up, reach down, um, open their bag, move the books out of the way, hold other folders back, slide the folder in, set the bag down, and return to an upright position at their desk for a total of 22 different connections on their brain circuit. 
if we can take a, a system and narrow it down quite a bit and use something that um, I'll talk about in a minute called the binder system for organizing papers, part of the binder system is just keeping the binder accessible uh, at all times. So then what happens is they grab the paper, they open the binder, they flip to the subject folder, they slide the paper in the folder, and they close the binder for a total of five connections. Now, if you look at this, if you picture every one of those loops on this screen here as a, um, an opportunity for an ADHD brain to lose power, any one of these connections is likely to get severed without any warning in an ADHD brain. And it's pretty easy when you look at this to understand now why a child with ADHD is going to struggle so much with organizing papers. When we have separate folders, notebooks, you know, the more supplies we have, the more things they have to manage, essentially it's more strain on their brain circuit. If we can narrow that down, you'll see with those five connections, they're so much more likely not only to maintain power to get through just five steps rather than 22, but also those five steps will quickly become a habit. And as soon as something becomes a habit, then the front cortex is no longer involved. So once the brain develops a, a process automatically, they don't have to rely on, on the front cortex. And that's, of course, going to be a huge relief for anyone with ADHD. And by cutting down all of these steps, what we find is there's 77% fewer steps, which actually makes someone with ADHD 440% more efficient. So this basic understanding of the circuitry, and by the way, um, I, this, this is my last slide, so we can um, switch over to um, switch back to your slides. But this understanding of, of the brain circuit and minimizing steps and thinking about the brain as, um, as an electrical organ, which is what it is, is really critical to almost any of the strategies that I share with parents and students about managing homework. And I'll probably be referencing that model quite a bit as we um, as we go through some of the questions that are coming in today. That's so logical, Susan, really helpful. Um, I'm going to start out with a question um, about homework, which we, about which we have many questions. So um, here's yes. one that seems to be a good introduction to this topic. Um, uh, uh, this person says, mom says, I have an eight-year-old son with ADHD who strongly resists starting homework and then completing the work in a timely manner. We've tried rewards, chunking, encouragement. Nothing seems to work. We waste so much time getting started that it prevents him from taking part in fun after-school activities. Somehow laying out the logic of getting this work done quickly just seems to have no effect. How can we help him create an inner desire to accomplish? I guess okay. my question to you, Dee, would, are, are, is, this, is that confusing two different issues? Resisting starting and creating an inner is a motivation issue. I'm not sure whether those are one question or two. So I over to you. <laughs> well, I think every parent can relate to it. It's just, it's that it's it's that ma massive headache that's caused by homework. So first of all, what I want to say is, you know, having just explained how the brain is working, this is not necessarily a problem of inner motivation. It's a power issue. It's not having the electrical power in the brain to adequately adequately get going. Um, for things that a child is really interested in, because that's the first thing parents will say is, well, why does it take them forever to get started on homework, but you know, something they're really interested in, they'll lock into right away. The reason that's happening is they're getting a surge of brain chemicals from another part of their brain when there's something they're interested in. Um, with homework, there, as, as you and I just discussed right before going live, you know, there's so many different factors that make homework difficult. One is that it's the end of the school day. They're very tired. They have been maxed out, and they're really working with very little resources at the end of the day. Oftentimes, medication is wearing off. So there's a lot of different things that are going on. Um, so first thing I want to say about that is let's not view the homework as an inner motivation Thing that, that's going to make the child feel like they're doing something wrong um, if they can't find the inner motivation to get going on homework. And quite frankly, most of us don't have a whole lot of inner motivation to do homework ourselves. Um, the next thing is, let's just talk about some good uh, ways to get going with homework to kind of help refuel and, and work around that power issue and, um, and make sure that homework doesn't get to be a situation where everything is growing out of control. Um, first thing I recommend to families is to set boundaries, is to just establish how much time you're willing to devote to homework every night and what types of behavior you expect from your child and what types of behavior you won't tolerate when the, 
when things are happening you won't tolerate, you walk away. Um, they can have consequences for that, and that's a whole, you know, long discussion about behavior management. But you as a parent have to set your boundaries and stick with them, or you will get sucked into the emotional vortex of fighting over homework. The second thing, and the following things will sort of help make that boundary process a little, a little easier for you. The second thing I recommend is to provide choices. Ask your child uh, when they want to start homework. And give, you want to give choices so you keep the parameters within something that you're willing to accept. Do they want to start homework right after school, or do they want to wait 40 minutes? Generally, taking a break is usually a good idea, especially for kids with ADHD, because they do need that brain break to refuel and get literally refuel their energy resources. Um, Dr. Barkley talked about this recently at Chad, about refueling uh, the executive function part of the brain. So that break is often very valuable. But some kids may choose to just get it done and over with. When they're given the choice, um, you might be surprised uh, how they will respond. This, and choices, by the way, are very empowering. They let the child feel like, like rather than them being told what to do all the time, they have a say. Um, very simple choices are very powerful. So don't underestimate the power of providing these, these very simple choices. So the next thing they can ask is where they want to do it. Do they want to do their homework in the kitchen or their bedroom or, you know, whatever locations are reasonable for you to accept. So step one um, is provide choices. Step two is to use music. And the key, the key here is to use the right music. Um, there's Baroque music is often recommended for concentration. There's also, if you go on Google or Amazon, you can do a search for brain music or music for concentration. You'll, you might need to test out a couple different types of music in different volumes, but um, that actually serves as a little bit of a power boost for the brain. The brain will respond to sound waves, and, um, and music really does help facilitate communicate, excuse me, concentration, even for children and adults with ADHD. Um, next thing, I recommend using a timer to so challenge your, ch your child to finish assignments within a certain amount of time. And I know a lot of parents do that. I saw that in the Facebook um, chat that we did a few weeks ago. But um, that's also a, an, a valuable tool to use. Um, number four, take brain breaks. This would be something like doing some jumping jacks or dancing to some hip-hop music or even doing some deep breathing, just closing the eyes and doing some deep breathing. This is essentially a way to help the brain uh, refuel and get some, a, a new source of energy. Aerobic activity is excellent for generating brain chemicals, but also taking some deep breaths is very good for that too, depending on what the child prefers to do. It's another opportunity to give your child some choices. Uh, one thing I just learned from Dr. Barkley at Chad was to sip on a sugar drink. Um, something like a sports drink or lemonade or even milk is a good source of glucose, but uh, that is this, a great way to send energy to the brain, and that really glucose is the only source of energy that the brain consumes. So um, a sugar drink is helpful. He, he made the point um, to sip, not gulp. Um, too much sugar, of course, is not going to be a good thing, but a little slow intake of sugar can be very helpful. Um, so there's just a few things I'm going to recap, but then I have my most important one to follow up with. Um, set boundaries, provide choices, use music, use a timer, take some brain breaks, sip on a sugar drink, and then the last thing is hire a homework helper. If you can at all find a way to do this, it usually doesn't take a whole lot of money. But homework produces anxiety, and anxiety flows freely when children are in the comfort of their parents. But when there is a homework buddy or someone other than a parent who is there to assist with homework, that anxiety gets corked a little bit and is challenged more productively. My son is a great example of this. I hire a local college student who comes to our house two nights a week, and she can get done in one hour what typically takes my husband and I three hours. You know, and I'm, I'm a specialist in this. I know all the strategies to use, um, all the tricks. And believe me, I use them all, and some work better than others with my son. But at the end of the day, there is no substitute for just taking this burden off the parent's shoulder and letting someone else step in and help. You can find, um, if you go to your local high school, National Honor Society moderator could likely refer you to a junior in high school. Anyone from junior in high school to junior in college is going to be a good age um, to help out. And the National Honor Society moderator will typically know of some really reliable kids that can help you out with that. That's a great tip. I have to say that that's one that 
was used, as I was telling you before we started in my household. Um, yes. Um, Susan, there are a number of questions here related to memory. Um, some moms are asking about difficulties learning math facts. Others are uh, mentioning the fact that their child will uh, pass a spelling test, but they immediately forget how to spell a word. And others are just, in general, um, talking about the problems of, of schoolwork when you have weak working memory. Do you have any um, suggest helpful suggestions on, work, on memory issues? Yes, I do. Um, there's a couple things that I have to say about this. For one, um, a lot of things are tied to working memory. Um, this would be math facts. Spelling is tied with working memory. Working memory deals with symbols. And if you go, if you think back to the image I shared of the brain being broken up into several different sections, the working memory is one small section of the brain. And I might be wrong on this, but from anything I've um, I've researched, I believe that the main source of neuron connections to the working memory is the front cortex. And as we know, ADHD, um, front cortex, uh, the front cortex isn't getting enough power, so consequently the working memory over the course of a child's lifetime is not developing very well. And that's why children are often going to struggle with any type of symbol. Um, my son, for example, and I think he, he represents a lot of uh, children that uh, have parents on the call, he's very, very bright, but he can struggle with math facts. I'm trying to get him to recall what 4 plus 1 or 6 plus 1. It's a long process for him. And in one hand, it can be so frustrating when I also see him solve very complex math problems that, that give me trouble. Um, he solves those with no problem. We want to remember, again, the brain has several different sections, and working memory is what's in play when they're trying to re recall basic math facts or trying to remember how to spell something. The, way, the best way to work around this is to apply context. Anytime you can give a, um, a problem some context, what we're doing is we're accessing other parts of the brain that process information, um, different types of information. So, for example, if you can encourage a child to picture four apples plus one apple. It seems so simple, but as soon as they get that image in their mind, now we're accessing other areas of the brain to help recall what the answer might be. Um, spelling, first of all, that also sounds like a simple answer. It's still going to be a struggle for them. So just acknowledge the fact, too, that math facts and spelling are always going to be a struggle for kids with this working memory challenge. If you really want to get in-depth with it, there are a couple of programs I recommend for um, teaching spelling in a very systematic way that's, that's excellent. Um, it's called All About Spelling. It's based on the widely popular Orton-Gillingham method, but All About Spelling is something that parents can teach at home, or in our case, I hire my homework buddy who does um, All About Spelling with my son. Um, it's a great way to take a very advanced reading program and make it accessible for someone who doesn't have any training. Um, Math Facts, there's also a program that's published by City Creek Press, and I believe their website is citycreek.com. They put out a book that, that gives characters to each of the, the numbers, and they create little scenarios to help students remember the basic Math Facts. That's their way of applying context. It's very effective. The stories are a little cheesy, so I always tell parents, if you're going to share that with your kids, just acknowledge that it's cheesy right out of the gate and laugh through it, you know, so that, so that they don't just emotionally shut off to it. Um, if they're expecting it to be kind of cheesy and you all laugh about it and, and understand it for what it is, it's really a great, um, a great tool. Um, and then other things that are helpful for memorization are um, just any time you can connect the new information to something a child already understands. That's really key. I've, I mentioned that already in trying to apply context to, you know, apples with basic math facts, but anything that you're learning. If you're reading a story and you want to improve reading comprehension, talk about what events are happening in the story that the child has experienced before, or that are similar to what the child has experienced before. If you're reading a nonfiction text, is there anything that the child has ever experienced or seen before that they can draw a connection to? Look at the pictures in the textbook. Draw connections to that. Connections, again, picture those neurons connecting across all the different sections of the brain. That's gold for um, improving memorization. 
There's a whole set of questions here, Susan, about time management. Um, some of them are around managing um, a planner. So um, parents saying that their children have a hard time planning out the homework for the week, having a good sense sure. of when things are due, when they're not due. So right. I'm saying, you know, a struggle to get things written into the planner or use you, to use the planner at all. Do you have any any thoughts on time management, or is that time the time management issues or? Um, yeah, yeah. Well, this, that's that's definitely one of the most difficult things for students to do. And again, if you picture all those steps on the brain circuit for organizing papers, um, the process for accessing a planner is usually pretty it just as complicated. You know, if we picture our kids in class and the teacher announces that there's a homework assignment due, the process of digging through the book bag to find their planner, to flip through all the right pages to get to the right page, to and then find a pen, you know, it's it's pretty much a disaster for most kids unless they have a very specific strategy in place to access that planner quickly. So that's the first thing is just make sure that the planner is as accessible as possible. And that in and of itself is probably going to take a month of coaching. Um, a couple tips that are helpful for that is use a binder clip to mark the current page. Um, binder clips work better than paper clips because paper clips will slide off. Um, some kids have bookmarks, but those are kind of hard for the kids to find often. So binder clip makes a nice, quick, easy handle to just quickly flip to the right page. And then also keep a pen. You might even have to buy a special pen from the store that's small and narrow. Nowadays, all these pens are really wide, and they won't fit in the um, spiral binding of the planner. But find a nice, narrow pen with a clip on it and keep that in the spiral binding of the planner. And then finally, encourage the child to keep their planner in a place where they can grab it very quickly. So maybe it's the very front pocket of their book bag, if they've got two pockets on their book bag. Or um, if they carry a binder around, I always encourage them to keep that planner just tucked right inside the binder. Not in the binding itself, that becomes too bulky, but just um, right as they open up the um, front flap, they can just set that planner right on top. All those things are going to make the planner a lot easier for them to access. And then, um, they also need to be coached on when they should use that planner. So thinking forward to different times throughout the day when they should be expecting to use the planner. Um, towards the end of their class period, um, at, at the end of the day when they're standing at their locker, and, and that will all need some very specific visualization and coaching. Again, this is probably one of the more difficult strategies of anything I teach is getting kids to use uh, the planner in a way that works, with, that works for them. Um, and then also something that's really helpful for families in general is to take some time every Sunday night, just a few minutes. You want to keep this informal, but where everyone pulls out their planners and calendars, parents included, and they just discuss what's coming up uh, for, the, for the future week. This is a great way to begin modeling the process of thinking forward. The, the, the process of time management is a, it's a long haul for, for students with ADHD to internalize, but the ways that in which parents can help coach that is, again, by taking some time on Sunday evening just to plan forward, look at everyone's calendar together. Um, a good way to keep this from, from becoming a nag fest from the parents is for the parents to share their schedules too and just look ahead. You know, what's due this week? What, um, what do you need to be prepared for? What's your plan for studying for that? That's all very helpful. Okay. Um, that's great. Um, there's, there are a number of questions here about motivation. Parents who say, you know, my my child just says he just doesn't care. He just, he, he he doesn't care. He doesn't care how what he does, how well he does in school. Or another person who's a 16 year old son, he's become less and less um, interested in school. Loves sports. He can get through school, but he really just doesn't care to isn't motivated to really work at excelling. And he's coming up upon ACTs, SATs, and so forth. Um, any thoughts on that? Sort of, I just don't care. Um, it seems, from the questions I'm looking at, these are oftentimes parents of boys. Right. Um, mentioning this. Yes. Well, this is an excellent question. Um, I actually have on, on my website, which is studyskills.com, I have a free guide we give away specifically addressing the issues of motivation. But um, let me just talk about this briefly now. What's really happening is, you know, if you think about it, for a kid with ADHD, a child with ADHD, um, 
school is very, very difficult. It's all about the executive function and how well they can manage their executive function tasks. And that's a very draining process and it's a very difficult process for them. So naturally, they're going to lose interest in it. You know, it I, I'm just thinking about something that I'm not very crazy about doing. I don't like to draw, for example. I probably don't like to draw because I'm not good at it. And if I had to spend all my time doing something I wasn't very good at, I would quickly lose motivation for that too. So um, the first thing that I really encourage parents to to do is step back from school. The best way to motivate a kid in school is actually to take the pressure off of school for a bit and just spend some time celebrating the things that they do well. You know, the boys that are, are really interested in sports, just be a fan of them and encourage them to be involved in sports and, and take an interest in anything else they're interested in and acknowledge that you're just going to pull some pressure off of school for a bit. One of the things right. I find really interesting is when um, when parents are talking to me about the motivation issue and, you know, that, that he's struggling with this in school and he's struggling with that, and I will ask, well, what is it that your child likes to do? What gets him or her excited? And as soon as I ask that question, I can, I can see it in their face if I'm with them face-to-face -face, or I can even hear it in their voice if we're just talking over the phone, where they just get lighter, they lean forward, their body language changes. So that's just one thing to, to keep in mind is make sure you're celebrating the things that they do well. And then, then also take a look at your expectations and standards. A lot of times kids are, are willing to get the work done, but and this is usually a battle between moms and sons. Um, and this is, some of it is a female-male thing, and some of it, it has to do with ADHD, but a lot of times Boys especially will answer a question, for example, on the homework, and they've answered it to, to just complete the objective. Now, the mom will be upset because they know that there's maybe three paragraphs more worth of information inside their child's brain that is not reflected on the paper. So they're pushing for them to do more, but, but the child's looking at it and saying, why? I did enough. I answered the question. And, you know, in the real world, often that is enough. Um, so just think about what it is you're encouraging your child to do. Is it a skill that will help them in the real world? One thing that's critical to my being able to, to build a business is being able to recognize when I need to be very detailed and recognize when enough is enough. Um, and that's really something that we should actually be encouraging with our kids because it will be very helpful for them in the real world. So sometimes we might just be pushing too hard and expecting things, expecting them to do things that they just don't see the purpose in. And, the, and my gauge for that is just what will the expectations be in the real world. Oh, that's really interesting, yeah. Um, and maybe speaks to the highly competitive academic environment that we, our kids all are growing up in nowadays. Um, mm -hmm. uh, a question from um, the parent of a 10-year-old fifth grader asks, how can I help him learn to listen and raise his hand in class rather than always blurt out his opinion and blurt out answers in the classroom? Oh, this is a good question. <laughs> typically, <laughs> typically, they're blurting because they're afraid they're going to forget what it is they want to say. Oh, so um, what I have encouraged students to do is if they have something they want to say and they're afraid they're going to forget it, try to grab the thought, you know, mentally grab the thought and just hold on to it in their hand. So they can like hold a finger real tight in their hand um, or even hold a fist in their hand as if they're just holding on to that thought. That will actually help them recall the, the thought better. Um, and sometimes they're going to lose it before a teacher is able to call on them. And then in that case, I tell them, you know what, if you if you lose it, then it probably wasn't that important to share from the beginning. So that's, that takes a little bit of coaching and a little bit of encouragement. They're very reluctant to give up. You know, they, when they have this great, brilliant thought, they want the world to know. That's part of what makes their personality so dynamic and exciting. But we can't always be blurting things out. So when you have something you really are dying to say, and you're afraid you're going to forget, just try to hold on to it in your hand. And if you lose it, it will either come back to you if it's important enough or it just wasn't that important to begin with. 
Um, that's an interesting one about sort of impulsivity. And here's, here's an analogous question about impulse control, which in which the parent, Mary, says that her adolescent son insists on drawing during class to keep his behavior in check. But he misses the lecture and notes. And what's an alternative to help him stay focused and stay in control? Um, well, a great thing that um, is very inconspicuous are the little squish balls or the squeeze balls. So he could be doing that in one hand and taking notes with the other. Um, that's probably going to be the easiest thing if schools are open to it and also if the kids are open to it, which often is not the case. But you know, having um, di something different to sit on, like a bouncing ball. I know a lot of classrooms are adding um, some bounce balls to replace chairs in the classroom or the ability to stand if there's a way that he can stand someplace that wouldn't be distracting for the rest of the class. Um, those are all possibilities, but, but typically you know, the easiest thing would be just to have something in one hand that he can be squishing or playing with while he can be taking notes with the other. Right. Here's an interesting question about um, reading. My son is, says that he absorbs information better when it's given verbally um, rather than reading a textbook. He can read it several times and have difficulty retaining it. Is this typically an ADHD symptom? So well, I guess the question really is about um, or, you know, oral learners sure. and how they should best learn. Um, yeah, it, this very well could be related to ADHD. Um, when we read, we're using several more sections of the brain than when we're just listening. So it absolutely would make sense that listening to something would, would be less strain requiring less power, you know, less brain power, um, would make it easier to process. Now, some kids are going to be able to listen just fine, such as the person asking this question, but there's a lot of parents out there who are probably thinking there's no way that my child could sustain the attention long enough to listen. So that's, you know, that's really going to be up to each, dependent on each individual child. But if the auditory thing works for a child, then you know, there's a logical explanation for why that's working. So audio books, books on tape? That... Yes, audio books are, are a wonderful way for, um, for kids to learn anything, but also an excellent tool for learning how to read, too. Part of that is, is as there are more questions about kids getting older, high school, getting ready for college, um, having problems in college, keeping attention. You know, now there are, there are much longer lectures. Um, how do... How to, how to, ADHD kids prepare for college and what should they look for in terms of college success? Well, um, goodness, this is, you know, I could do a whole long webinar on this topic <laughs> alone. There's a couple things I'd like to say to this. Um, first of all, my own experience and how I ended up learning study skills is um, when I, I struggled all through school. I didn't know I had ADHD until a year and a half ago, but I stu uh, struggled all through school. And when I started college, I knew something would have to change or I wasn't going to make it through. So I started um, finding some resources on preparing for college, and that's really where I, where I started using study skills. Um, I was taking these study skills I was learning and kind of breaking them down because I couldn't remember all the steps. And that's really where my study skills program came from, was just taking little bits and pieces of other things to make them less complicated. But... Um, that turned me from a struggling student into being able to get a 3.9 in college right away my first semester and to maintain that. And it was much easier than anything I'd done before. So, you know, it's my own personal story and testimony is that study skills can make a world of difference. And the reason for that, of course, I didn't understand this until a year and a half ago when I recognized ADHD in myself, um, is that it's a process of cutting down those circuits and minimizing the steps to bare minimum so it's not such a strain on, on our brains. Um, uh, text, learning how to read a textbook efficiently is really going to be critical for kids in college. And um, that's something that would require a little bit more time and demonstration than, than the webinar would allow. But um, there's some quick strategies that can get kids, um, students of all ages, comfortable with reading a textbook efficiently, and then when they do that, particularly in college, if they can read the chapter ahead of time, because they all get a syllabus uh, ahead of time, 
then when they show up to class, now they know what the teacher's talking about, and now they have a, sort of a mental framework for everything that the teacher talks about to tie in um, and make those connections, um, the, the all important connections for, for learning. So um, another piece that I'd like to mention is um, taking a year off. Now this would need to be done with some with a plan, with a very clear plan. But um, there are ADHD coaches. I just heard um, Robin Wright from uh, Ned Hallowell's clinic. Um, she spoke at Chad recently, and she talked about the gap year, which is taking a year between high school and college to do some very structured activities, but to do something a little bit different from school. And um, that's really beneficial for a lot of students who, again, they've had such a strain on their brain for so many years that taking that break actually is a great way to refuel, literally repower their brain and sort of um, start fresh with, usually with a renewed sense of motivation when they get into college. But that's something, um, you can Google gap year and you can find some coaches and other um, structured programs that can be helpful for that too. Are there certain things that kids should look for in colleges who, who have ADHD as they're thinking about um, college? Are there, I mean, I guess the obvious would be disability services. Um, is there anything that you recommend? Yeah, I think, you know, a lot of this is going to be what their personal preference of environment and so forth. But generally, the smaller school, the smaller a school is, the more one-on-one -on -one attention they can get. Um, and one-on-one -on -one attention is available at any school, even large schools, if they know where to go for it. But oftentimes, that's going to require more of that executive function processing that isn't their strong suit. So smaller schools are better. Um, there are a lot of schools that advertise in, um, in Attitude that are you know, very friendly for students with ADHD and aware of their special needs. So that's certainly a great resource. Um, but even within the public universities, state colleges, um, community colleges, it's more about knowing where to find those supportive resources than it is about um, in general, this school. You know, if you don't have the budget for some of the schools that are advertised, um, you can find those resources in the in your local community colleges and so forth. Um, you can look for an ombudsperson. That's something you can Google for your local school. Um, ombudsperson is um, someone that is a student advocate, and um, they're typically going to help when there's challenges that are arising within the school and sometimes legal issues, but they're a good person to check in with about where you can find the best resources on campus. They're going to be able to tell you all the things that aren't necessarily published right on the school's website. I have a follow-up question here from Wendy who wants um, asked if you could explain a bit more about the recommendation of the binder system. Oh, yes. Could just be a bit more detailed on how that binder system works. Sure, sure. Well, obviously the premise is about reducing the amount of things that a child needs to keep track of. So most teachers will say um, they want each child to have a separate folder and separate notebook for their class. And their, mind, their mindset is if they keep everything from my class separate from all their other classes, they're more likely to keep it organized. That's actually the, the exact opposite of, is true when, particularly when dealing with a child who has ADHD, the more supplies you add, the more complicated it's going to get. So a binder is about condensing all those folders and notebooks down to one three-ring binder. The key here is make sure the binder is no larger than one and a half inches in diameter. If you go any larger than that, then it gets too bulky for the kids to handle. But you can actually put all of your folders and notebooks into one one and a half inch binder. Um, you can find folders at any office supply store and get some vinyl folders that are nice and durable, and um, one folder per subject. And then those folders also can act as subject dividers. And instead of using spiral bound notebooks, you just use loose leaf notebook paper and insert behind um, each of the folders that, um, again, act as subject dividers. Don't those folders get really full quickly? <laughs> they, they can, and so you want to have a spot at home, a designated location where they can put their extra um, binder overflow. So that can be um, you know, a file box. It should be something very easily accessible. Um, on our website, we sell something um, that hangs from the wall that has 
different color folders. So with one hand, kids can take um, papers out of their binder and just slide them into the folders that hang on the wall. Um, so that is, that is helpful, for sure, to have, and actually critical to making sure the binder works, is to have a place at home that you can put extra papers that you're not using. But what that does, by having that one binder instead of the, you know, sometimes kids have 14 or 16 different folders of notebooks, you've got one. And now that one binder goes with them everywhere. It goes to school, it comes home, it goes to every class. They don't have to stand at their locker and figure out which folder or notebook they need to take home. They, um, they don't, especially because when folders and notebooks are all stacked on top of each other, they all look alike. So, um, and even with color coding, color coding is a symbol processing. You know, they have to stand at their locker when they're in a rush to either get to their next class or get to the bus. And they have to try to process, okay, green is this subject. Do I have homework in that subject? No. Okay, I can leave that here. You know, it's several levels of processing at a time when they're really rushed. And so um, you know, it's very, very difficult for them to keep all that stuff organized. Much better to just have one binder that they're taking with them everywhere. Then they only have one thing they have to keep track of. Does this um, system help? There's another question here um, um, from a mother about her child just forgets to bring home the relevant book or materials. And similarly, another person asked about a child who does the homework but forgets to take it to school to turn it in. Okay. Yes, it will help. Um, also, let me just say very quickly, for kids that are not quite in middle school yet, one folder versus a binder is typically appropriate. Um, as long as they're seeing just one teacher uh, for their main subjects, then just a simple folder is all that that child needs. A lot of these elementary kids, however, are getting sent home with three and four different folders, and they can't keep track of what's supposed to go where. So um, work with the teacher to, to condense it all down so that only one folder is going back and forth between home and school. Um, and by the way, this is a great thing to include as an accommodation on 504 or um, an IEP, is to have one folder or one binder. Um, but back to your question about other supplies. Yes, when the folders and, and, and notebook situation is is minimized so dramatically, then the um, ability to remember other textbooks it becomes easier. I'm not going to say the problem goes away. It just becomes a lot easier because now they're dealing with significantly fewer items. Um, they still are going to need some coaching about using that planner, um, about um, thinking about all their transition points through the day, and you know when they're standing at their locker or looking at their desk at the end of the day what they need to be looking through and thinking about in terms of what to bring home. This isn't, um, it's not, the, the problem's not gonna, going to be cured instantly, but it's going to be solved much more quickly by using a binder. Um, and then as far as getting papers back to school, that's where the binder's really helpful too. They have that one tool. So um, there's a, typically you want to get a, a binder that's got a pocket in the front cover, you know, vinyl pocket. It's built right into the binder. That front pocket can be used for anything that needs attention when the child gets home at the end of the day, and then anything that needs to be turned in the next day can go right in that front pocket. So that will serve as a visual reminder of what they need to turn in. This will work miracles, really. It's, it's, it's by far our most successful strategy um, in all the years I've been teaching. As simple as it is, it is the most popular strategy that we teach. And I've got some more details about it, too, that um, are available through uh, on your website. Yep, through our website. Great. OK. Um, uh, two questions. I mean, here's, here's an interesting question. Um, this is a middle school or seventh grader whose school requires that most of the homework be done on the computer. A lot of the assignments are online, and there are online systems now that schools use to, to manage homework. And she says that you know, her daughter gets very distracted by all the distractions that are on the screen mm -hmm. and on the computer, and how, um, how should she manage that? Okay, first of all, she has an excellent question, and I don't really have a very good answer for this one at this point in time. I'm, I have to believe there is some type of software out there, you know, um, the child safety software, that, that she could probably put in place to limit her access when she's on the computer. And to be very honest with you, I need to use something like that myself because <laughs> I, I have that problem when I'm on the computer. It is so easy to go you know, check something online or check the email or go onto Facebook or you know whatever else the students are interested in. So um, it's, gosh, that is, um, it's a distraction landmine really. But um, I, 
best I can say right now is if, if she can find some software to limit her access to different things while she's doing homework, that would be probably the best way to go. I think she thinks she's talking about even the screen itself. You know, even if she stays on top of the, screen, the computer the screen racking thing. Okay, if that's the case, yeah. yeah, well, that's a, that's a good point. And, um, and that could very well be, again, um, because of all the backlighting on a computer screen, that screen is sending a lot of visual input to the brain. So um, changing the background color on the screen is an option. I don't, I don't know how to do it, but I know it's possible. I'm sure if a quick Google search would tell you how. Um, different background colors will have um, uh, better effects than others for, for kids, for anybody. This is, this is for adults, too. Um, it, what that does when you change the background color is it reduces the number of different colors that are, are um, being processed uh, in the visual processing center of the brain. So that can be very, very helpful. Um, I actually wrote a whole article on that, um, it, that piece. And even just dimming the brightness of the screen might be very helpful, too. That's, that's, that's really fascinating, yeah. Um, Here's a question. I think this is something that comes up a lot for parents um, from Sarah. How do we develop a positive working relationship with our son's teacher? His fifth grade teacher, um, her classroom and homework routines are constantly changing. We've asked if she email communicate with us, but she insists that it's our child's responsibility to organize himself. And, um, <laughs> uh, yeah, um, this is an excellent question. And, um, you know, for any parent dealing with teachers, it's a dance. It's um, what I do personally is, and, I, and I, this comes from my time in the classroom as well, the, te the parents that came in right at the beginning of the school year or at the start of a new semester who would drop a card or and this is maybe two of them would drop a card or bring a plate of brownies or anything simple or even just send an encouraging email about, hey, you know, thank you so much for your time in teaching my child and we're here if we need anything. Those parents, I just right away, I knew I could work with them. And um, I found that when they brought concerns to my attention, I was much less resistant to working with them because I knew we had a good partnership together. A lot of times, Teachers are burned out from lots of, of individual requests from so many families when they just don't have the, the resources and the, the time to meet everybody's individual needs. Um, so, so just doing little kind things, dropping off little gifts. And when I say gifts, I mean like some baked goods, a candy bar, um, a $5 gift card from Starbucks. A, um, which they might not even technically be allowed to accept, but just simple little tokens of your appreciation is what I'm getting at. Encouraging emails and phone calls, all those things are very helpful. And that's what I do with my kids' teachers. I, I go out of my way to, um, like when that was the holidays coming up, to give them some nice tokens of our appreciation with special notes attached. Because when I have an issue, I know I'm going to need them to work with me. Um, so being proactive right out of the gate is really helpful. But you are going to have teachers that either aren't interested in working with you or maybe they don't see, they can't appreciate um, the special needs of ADHD. A lot of people, unfortunately, think ADHD is an excuse. Um, the best thing you can do is attempt to educate them. Not always possible. <laughs> I mean, Everyone here on this call knows what I do for a living, and um, I just within the last couple of months had a situation with one of my son's teachers where it was evident to me no matter what information I shared, it, she just didn't want to hear it. Um, so in that case, I just had to pick my battles. Um, if this is a teacher that the child's with all day long, it might be a matter of requesting a new teacher, especially if the teacher's policies are changing all the time. It might be time to get the principal involved. It might be time to just do some things at home for the child that you normally would not do and explain, you know what, I'm doing this for you because we're struggling together. You know, if, if you were in a real job, you would either move on to a new job or you know, you'd have to talk with your boss and you'd have to get this resolved. Um, 
every situation is very different, and um, I think parents struggle with um, stepping in to do too much. The best way to think about that is what am I teaching them for the future? What am I teaching them for the real world? And if you have to offer a bit of a, a coddling situation for a little bit to get through something, make sure your child knows why you're doing it. We've, we haven't really talked about writing, and there are a number of parents who say their kids are, are really great readers, but they really struggle to, to, to integrate, to write more than a few sentences, to put ideas on paper in a cogent fashion. Are there any techniques that you recommend or tips that you have, especially for ADHD kids, to write, yeah. to learn to write better? I do. Um, I, I do and I don't. <laughs> Let's put it that way. Mm -hmm. Handwriting, I know, is something that a lot of kids with ADHD struggle with. Again, the reason for that is we've got some inefficient, a lot of inefficient neuron connections going on, and when you bring handwriting into the mix, you're adding a whole new set of um, processing um, or a whole new level of brain processing that has to happen over and above the thought processing. So that's just something to be aware of. And um, to be honest with you, I that's one piece I'm still really trying to dig into myself to figure out a, a, a solid and succinct answer for improving the efficiency of handwriting. Um, but as far as getting ideas out on paper, and, um, and putting them in a logical order. Mind mapping is a very great tool for students to do that. There's, there's a bazillion different ways you can do mind mapping, and to be honest with you, I struggle myself to understand most of them. But what I'm talking about is getting the main concept in the center of the page and just drawing symbols if you have to or keywords all around of anything that you know about that topic and then figuring out um, a logical order to, to put those topics in. This will often need some guidance from a parent, a tutor, or an educator to get those things in logical order, but it's surprisingly more easier, or, excuse me, it's surprisingly easier than most people would think once it's all out in a, in a map form versus listing things. When you have something in a linear list, that's going to be really difficult for the, for the kids to move around, for students, I should say, to move the, um, that around. I also teach a very specific way of, um, of organizing notes for research reports that, believe it or not, I taught to my third graders when I was in the classroom, and then I used the same process to write my master's thesis when I was in grad school. So um, it involves a file folder and creating pockets out of envelopes and moving index cards all around which um, some might sound a little complicated, but it's actually a very easy way to, um, to teach students how to organize their concepts and put them in a logical, uh, logical fashion. So um, another oh, thing that's like, yeah, okay, go ahead. Go ahead. I was say, another thing that's really good is um, if you look up Foursquare Organizer, there, that's a popular method for organizing paragraphs. And um, one of, it was one of my favorites when I was teaching elementary school. Um, my son's school taught it taught that organizing strategy to him. And it, again, he struggled, he's got dyslexia, he struggles with writing, um, but he has really been able to internalize organization of thoughts with that Foursquare organizer. Um, there are a couple of questions about technology. Are there certain tools, um, iPad readers, other um, tools that you recommend for middle school and high schoolers? Specifically, here's one from Christy. My son is a great auditory learner. I'm getting ready to purchase the Intel reader that will copy any book he can play it when he wants. Have you heard of this? And how well does it work? Is there, are there other technologies that you recommend? Um, unfortunately, I am not very familiar with technology. And I, um, I myself want to take note of, um, of what she just mentioned and check it out myself. But I will say this, that the concept of, of it sounds fantastic. And um, I am a big proponent of anything auditory if it works for you know, for your child or for specific students. Some students aren't going to have the patience to sit and listen, but others will thrive with that. Um, so I think that's a great idea. And what I would recommend is just that she look for um, reviews online for the software. And that's you know that's what I would do myself before buying something. And um, um, I think typically reviews are going to 
they're going to tell you all the pros and cons. I mean, it's interesting. My daughter, who's a huge auditory learner, too, I'll just chime in here. Um, mm-hmm. uh, her school, she's in college now, offers Kurzweil. They will scan any of her textbooks and, and mm-hmm. give her a CD. And she just cannot stand the way the computer voice sounds. Okay. So it just hasn't been useful for her. She finds it just, you know, very annoying. She says that she, she grew up listening to Jim Dale read Harry Potter, and this just isn't the same. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah, you might want to test it out before you spend lots of money on the Intel reader because your child may react like mine and just not want to listen to um, to a yeah. computerized sort of automated voice. Susan, we're sort of out of time. This has been really terrific. Um, so many helpful suggestions. Is there anything that you'd like to say just in conclusion? Um, well, you know what? In conclusion, I'd just like to share a brief story where um, I, I referenced already where I had an issue with um, a small issue with my child's teacher not too long ago, and it's something I had to make a request over and over and over again. It literally took 10 requests before the thing was finally taken care of. And when I got to about request number eight, I finally had to tell my son what was going on and, and say it in a you know, very nice way. I really did not think his teacher was trying to make our life miserable or anything, but there was a block somewhere that I couldn't figure out where it was. So I just explained to him, Mark, you know, I am trying to get this resolved. I've asked um, your teacher several times, and I'm just going to keep asking. And and I said to him, when, um, specifically, I said, I will just keep asking, and, um, you know, whatever it takes, I will not stop fighting for you. And I didn't even realize the power of my words when I said it, 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 but the second I said that, I will not stop fighting for you, he just lunged at me with a hug. Oh. And I knew in that moment that's all, that's really what mattered. It didn't matter as much what was happening at school as long as I was still his advocate. Um, I believe in, in raising our kids uh, with, with high expectations and, I, and, and not coddling, um, but at the same time, we have to give them the support to be successful. And it's a, it's a tough battle for all of us, but we are our children's advocate. And I would just encourage parents, give yourself a pat on the back for all the wonderful things you are doing for your child. Um, and when you have those battles, um, at school, stay connected with a community that can support you. Attitude is a wonderful community for that. And, um, and just remember to stay, you know, talk to your child openly about what you're doing, why you're doing it, and that is ultimately what's going to determine their success in life. Well, that's great. So just stay, stay on their side and stay with them. And, you know, and it's so easy to descend into criticism and to get into battle, so I think that's great advice. Susan, thank you again, and thank everyone, um, all of you. And uh, we'll sign off now. So thanks again. All right. Thank you. Bye-bye. For more Attitude Podcast and information on living well with attention deficit, visit attitudemag.com. That's A-D-D-I-T-U-D-E-M-A-G.com.